Joe, it's a pleasure to be with you, and I'm always glad to get to your phone calls and your emails. You know, the federal government has another shutdown looming on Friday, and I thought we'd discuss that with Brandon Arnold, who knows a whole lot more about it than I do. He is the executive vice president of the National Taxpayers Union, a group that I, I don't have any formal connection to, but I endorse its work all day long. Brandon, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Lars. So we're going to see the U.S. government shut down this Friday because, you know, some of us, at least uh, under many circumstances, are happier when the government shut down anyway. Uh, although, well, you know, it, it, it does it does have some practical bad side effects. But frankly, they don't seem to be doing what we need them to do anyway. Well, I, I agree totally. And, and as somebody who lives in the Washington, D.C. area, I appreciate the fact that traffic is much lighter when the government <laughs> shuts down. But i got to tell you. Politically and economically, I just don't think a government shutdown is in our best interest because what happens with backfires almost every single time, the Washington Post, the New York Times, all of the mainstream media already have their stories written about these horrible things that occur when the government shuts down. Veterans or senior citizens that don't get payments they're supposed to get. Uh, businesses that don't get certain benefits that they're supposed to get and therefore have to close their doors or lay off workers immediately. All of these horrible stories are already written, and they're just waiting to run them and to blame Republicans for every bad thing that happens when the government shuts down. And it's by the way, by the way, they, they've got a compromise plan that you point out, uh, Mike Johnson, the new speaker, and I'm still keeping my powder dry on him. I'm not sure about him just yet, and I can tell you why. But he's got this compromise plan that that, dr that drops a bunch of conservative priorities like say cutting spending or maybe slowing down the invasion at our southern border and he drops all this stuff out and uh, and and yet there's no guarantee the democrats will even say yes to that yeah i mean this is a short-term spending patch that we call a continuing resolution it's just intended to get us through the holidays into January or for some agencies into early February. It, no, it does not have all the important provisions that we absolutely need to include, but this is just teeing up that process because the House has only passed seven of its 12 spending bills thus far. The Senate's only passed three. So this is buying time in order to do the work that we need to do to rein in the Biden administration through spending reductions and also through these policy provisions that they attach to the spending, uh, to the spending bills to make sure the Biden administration cannot run amok anymore. I'm talking to Brennan Arnold, who's executive VP at the National Taxpayers Union. And yet, doesn't this take us right back to the whole speaker fight? Because you had, uh, you know, the previous House Speaker who only got the votes necessary to become Speaker back in January by making promises. We will do budgets by regular order. We will pass appropriations bills in regular order. He didn't get the job done, didn't fulfill his promises, went to a continuing resolution. And so he gets the boot and they put in Mike Johnson. And now isn't he headed down the same path? I hope not. Because I think, first of all, Mike Johnson has better buy-in from all wings of the Republican Party currently, the most conservative wing, the most moderate wing, you name it. And I think he deserves the benefit of the doubt here. You know, okay. McCarthy had a chance. He, he, he annoyed some people. He you know, kicked some people off. He lost the trust of many in his conference. I think Mike Johnson deserves the benefit of the doubt. So far, he's, he's a very well-liked member of Congress. He's super intelligent. I don't know if you've had him on your program or not. Very, have not yet, but guy. we plan to because he is a very smart guy. And frankly, one of the things I admire most about him, Brandon, is the the, the kind of funny reaction like Speaker, I think Babylon B said, uh, members of Speaker of Mike Johnson's family surprised to learn he's in Congress. That guy has flown a very <laughs> low profile, hasn't he? He has. You know, he led the Republican Study Committee, which was his biggest claim to fame. And that is the largest block of conservative Republicans in the House of Representatives, and he did a very good job running the RSC, I must say. Uh, he's somebody we've worked closely with over the years, but you're right, he does not have the public profile of a Jim Jordan or a Steve Scalise. Uh, we tried those guys, and it didn't work. So, again, I just think we need to give Mike Johnson the benefit, of the, the benefit of the doubt. If Republicans don't unify around him and give him a chance to actually serve as their leader, a chance to negotiate with Chuck Schumer and Joe Biden to pass these spending bills, then I don't think we have any shot whatsoever of making the kinds of reforms that we need to make. Okay, so for a, a, a you know, look, I, I've covered 
some national politics, but not from Capitol Hill. And I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy uh, because I think it's incredibly hard to understand how these people can't get their job done. But when they say, well, we'll push this off to January, we'll get past Christmas and the New Year, and then things will be different. But they're not going to be any different in January, or are they? I mean, I hope so. Again, I think we have to give folks a chance. I would like a shorter term. Under normal circumstances, I would say do a much shorter continuing resolution. But the problem is if you have Christmas as the backstop, awful things happen because people just want to get home to their families, back to their districts, and they let all sorts of things slide. They end up passing all sorts of pork barrel spending, horrible increases to programs that should not be funded, period. So we do need to get into the new year here to give us a reasonable chance to pass leaner spending bills. It's really the only path forward that I can see as viable. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, Mike Johnson can actually flex his muscle here, uh, you know, We'll see if it materializes. Uh, you know, there's, there's certainly cause for skepticism, uh, but the, the conservative appropriations bills that they've started to move in the House, I think, are a very, very different set of bills than what we've seen in my two decades of working on Capitol Hill and around Capitol Hill. Brendan, do, do these folks not understand we're out of money? We're thirty-three trillion in debt. We've got tens or hundreds of trillions of dollars in unfunded mandates, Social Security, Medicare, etc. So. You know, they don't. Well, and I've def, I've defended Donald Trump before because they'll say, well, Trump spent all this money. I said, Trump doesn't spend a dime. The Constitution tells me who spends the money. The House and the Senate decide what money gets spent. The president can sign it or not sign it. But the point is that that a president doesn't decide on the spending decisions. Uh, he can at best refuse to sign it, veto it. And then it goes right back to them. The government shuts down for 30 days and then it happens anyway. So. What do we do when the government says, yep, we're going to go from one trillion of deficit to next year, two trillion of deficit starting October 1? That's insane when we're this deep in debt, isn't it? It's absolutely insane. And that's a huge problem that we've had. I think Republicans and Democrats alike have become desensitized to deficit spending. They just bought into this notion that it doesn't matter all that much. And it mattered, but it mattered a little bit less when inflation was close to zero and you had two percent inflation we could afford to borrow a little bit more now that inflation is as high as it is uh you know it's extremely expensive to finance the national debt you're seeing the national debt just interest payments on the national debt skyrocket it's the fastest growing portion of the federal budget it's going to exceed one trillion dollars in annual spending pretty soon it's already bigger than the entire gdp of the country of denmark it's insane it's an unsustainable path I think more eyes are starting to open with regard to the deficit and the debt. I think more politicians are starting to pay attention. But again, we got to hold their feet to the fire. Otherwise, we're going to be back to the bad old days pretty soon. Okay, so the bottom line is we're probably going to see a CR before this Friday. That'll bump it to January, and then we'll have the fight. Well, I think that's the only reasonable path forward. And I know it's not ideal. I would like to get the process moving faster, but unfortunately, the House has not finished all 12 bills yet. It's only seven bills through. Best case scenario, at the end of this week, they'll be done 10 out of 12, and then there's still the negotiating process with the White House and with the Senate. So there's a lot of legislative work to be done. Um, I don't want that to be done in a last-minute pre-Christmas deal. So yep. I think into the New Year is the most viable option. Okay, and there we are at over $2 billion a day just in the interest payments on our nation's debt. And believe me, we owe every single dime of it. That's Brandon Arnold from the National Taxpayer. Oh, it's a pleasure.